Yo, what up, slackers? Today I'm going to be reviewing a book called Thinking Fast and Slow. It's written by Daniel Kahneman. He is a professor at Princeton University, and more importantly, he's a Nobel Prize winner, or what we call a Nobel Laureate in economics. And equally important, he is from Israel. So when we think about uh, Nobel Laureates from Israel, I don't know how many we got, but it's definitely disproportionately high um, if you judge by the uh, number of people that they have in that country. So yeah, Israelis are smart. Can't argue against that. Okay, so Daniel Kahneman. In this book, he pioneered a way to think about the active process of thinking. And for each one of us, there are actually two cognitive systems that are at work. Not simultaneously, but they work together seamlessly. And he calls them System 1 and System 2. So System 1 is automatic. You can think of it as an autopilot. And it's also passive. You have no active control over it. Whereas system two is more active. It's the active thinking that you're putting into a thought. So for example, system one is more like driving your car because you don't have to think actively think about the process of driving when you're driving. And system two is more like working on a math problem because you actually have to think about that math problem when you're working on the problem. And that makes up the whole difference between system one and system two. And most of the time, we don't even realize that these two systems exist because one can switch to the other seamlessly without us even noticing. For example, when you are driving your car, and so then by default, you're in system one because the mechanics of driving is already automatic to you. But you can quickly switch from system one to system two. For example, if you're driving at a place where you don't know and you look at the road, you look at the street signs and those can actually, the, the, the simple act of reading the street signs and seeing where you are is by default uh, system number two. So, so, the, so both systems are there for you in your thought process, but you can't have both of them at the same time. It's either one or the other. And the point of the book is that we constantly live in system number one because I believe that it consumes less energy to be in system one because you're not actively thinking about what you are thinking. Whereas system two always makes us think that it is, that it is more important because we tend to measure how smart someone is by how well they do in system number two. Like how, how good are they at math? How good are they at reading? But in reality, system one is actually more important to our everyday lives and it's also more influential by far because, because system one is how we intuitively see the world and make our everyday decisions about our lives. So you can think of system one as being easy, whereas system two deals with things that are harder. So whenever you find yourself thinking, hmm, that's it, that you're probably in system one because System one prefers a more straightforward answer, such as um, why, and because system one is easier, so it takes up less mental capacity. So for example, if you're walking on a trail that you're familiar with, and that's so, that, so then you're in system one, and you can probably also in your head, as you're walking, do a math problem. That probably wouldn't be a challenge for you. However, if you're jogging, actually running in a neighborhood, let's say you're running in the hood and you don't know where the hell you are 
you're running to your car. And if somebody asks you, uh, I hope somebody doesn't approach you, but if somebody asks you to solve a math problem, you probably don't have the mental capacity to do it because, because a math problem requires system two to be activated, but your, but your system two is also activated when you're trying to search for your car. So you can only do one thing. You can only do one of those things at the same time. And vice versa, if your brain is always busy and occupied by system two, then you have very little capacity in your mental power to process other information. So you tend to make simple decisions and make quick judgments on things. And therefore, your kids are more likely to be racist or sexist while they're working on their math homework. And the, the next thing is that system one prefers a straightforward answer and it does it by association. So for example, so when you think about a phrase like Victoria's Secret, system one will, automatic, uh, will automatically associate that phrase with images of not necessarily the bras or the panties, but perhaps Giselle Bunchen. Adriana Lima, you know what I'm saying. So it's all about association. So when you think about Victoria's Secret, you would think, damn, it's hot, it's sexy, it's feminine. But really what you need to do is to activate your system too and think about why exactly is Victoria's Secret associated with the concept of sexy, hot? And maybe it's because Victoria's Secret models are very pretty girls with lots of makeup who have a very skinny body but good sized boobs. And these are women that you never see, almost never see in real life in this modern American society. I mean, you might see them if you live in Europe or especially Eastern Europe because, damn, those models generally came from Eastern Europe. But you know, by and large, those, those girls are so rare to actually spot in real life and scarcity creates value. So if you activate your system too while thinking about the phrase Victoria's Secret, it will probably be something like a marketing brand who employs these unrealistically hot, off the charts looking women um, out to get your money. And that's a more rational definition of Victoria's Secret than what you had from System 1. And there's one part of the book that I just don't like because this is not supposed to be a marketing book, but the author is saying that if you want to persuade people, aka get people to buy, then you need to appeal to their System 1 because System one urges people to make rash decisions. And for example, you want to use uh, bold fonts in your, um, so you want to use bold fonts in your reports, um, rhyming slogans in your advertising and make your company's name very easy to say. For example, if I say 15 minutes could save you, you would automatically fill out 15% or more on car insurance because Geico did such a fantastic job at activating your system one. So you automatically associate that phrase, the first part of that phrase, to the second part, which is 15% or more on your car insurance. And by the way, I didn't take any money from Geico, so yeah, this is not a plug. So how exactly does System 1 fuck up your reality? And one way that it does is by filling in the information that is missing from what's presented to you. And for example, if you see an athlete who is very good looking, then you're automatically assuming that him or her is also very good at his or her sport. 
that her, his or her skill level should match his or her looks. That's your expectation. That's the assumption. So that is system one at work trying to fill in that information, which is not necessarily true. Actually, it's almost never true. Um, with the exception of Cristiano Ronaldo. And that is also known as the halo effect, which is why beautiful people tend to be happier, richer, and go through life a little bit easier than everybody else. No, a lot easier. Um, and system one also tends to make us focus more on the content rather than the relevance. For example, on the media, we see horrible things like accidents or catastrophes or natural catastrophes happen. And we tend to associate our future with those events, even though the probability of those events happening is so rare instead of um, some normal some, some common health issues such as stroke or asthma, which may very well happen to each and every one of us. But we're a lot, we're usually a lot more concerned about earthquakes or hurricanes than those common types of health issues. So that's what the author means by content over relevance. And system one, also tends to make us forget that there's a rule called regression to the mean, which means over time, everything is going to converge toward a mean. So the best way to explain that is Linsanity and Jeremy Lin's NBA career after those years. Um, if you just think about the performance of Jeremy Lin, in 2012, during the stretch of those 10 or 15 games, you would think that for everything that's happened afterwards and how his career didn't really hit the heights that perhaps a lot of the fans would have hoped for was kind of unjust to him and his potential. But the alternative is just that, the alternative explanation is just that maybe Jeremy Lin is just another average player and his performance during the Linsanity um, spectacle was just a combination of luck and circumstance. And maybe a lot of factors were at play that rather than just a simple System 1 explanation that we come up with yeah, Jeremy was just that good. Basically, System 1 creates this distorted reality for all of us for us to rationalize the past based on very simple explanations. And the, the author has really a, a, put down a wonderful quote. And he said, the idea that the future is unpredictable is undermined every day by the ease with which the past is explained. I think you can't put it, you can't put it any better. Because we tend to insert very simple reasons to, to explain what's happened in the past. And we expect those reasons will read, and we think those reasons will induce the exact same outcome in the future, just as it has in the past. And this is something called the hindsight bias. And the other danger that is caused by system one is that we often overvalue our own talents. And this is because system one, it tricks all of us. There's no exception. It tricks all human beings to give simple answers to very difficult questions. And the term expert is very relative in reality, but the skills of, say, someone like a hairstylist is not the same 
as the expertise in very complex fields such as the stock market or politics because the latter have so much more factors at play that affects the performance of these so-called experts. So unless you can predict the outcome of an election or the performance of the stock market as accurately as you can predict how the outcome of a haircut will look like, then the politicians and the stock analysts should be paid the same rate as the hairstylist. But the positive impact of this overestimation of our own talents and optimism is that every day there's a new startup getting off the ground. And you know, knowing that about a third of American companies will make it past their year five anniversary, the amount of confidence exuded by American entrepreneurs is cannot be explained because almost a third of entrepreneurs said in an interview that their chance of failing was zero. And since System 1 has made every new entrepreneur thinking that they're so much smarter than the entrepreneurs who have failed before them, we have a never-ending stream of startups being funded and helping helping the American economy and these innovations help keep America the envy of the world. So thank you for System 1. And then Daniel Kahneman went one step beyond and he said if in our cognitive ability we have two systems then every person also has two selves. One is called the experiencing self, and the other one is called the remembering self. So the experiencing self is how you feel, what you're thinking at present. And the remembering self is your recollection of the experiences that your experiencing self has experienced. It's the remembering self that keeps the score of the experiences and makes, deci makes decisions about the future. And these two selves are constantly fighting over the quality of your experience. Because for the remembering self, the final stages always matters more. No matter what the overall experience is, if the experience itself had a very bad ending, then what the remembering self is going to re recall is going to be very much negatively influenced by the ending. This is a part where I actually disagree with the author because so while I do agree with him that there are two cognitive states, system one, quick decision making, autopilot, whereas system two is a concentrated thinking that requires more brain, um, more brain capacity, there's actually only just one self. Because the remembering self, to me, is just a collection of the experiencing self. So if you get asked the question like, do you like your job? How was your last relationship? Do you only think about the ending of that experience? Like, the final week of your job just when you handed in your two weeks notice or like do you remember your last relationship by the breakup and how that heart-wrenching defines that relationship so I, I I don't think that's the case for everybody maybe it is for some people so that's where I disagree with the author I don't think there's an experiencing self versus a remembering self. So if I tell you, for the next minute, try to experience and remember how you are feeling. And then a minute later, I ask you, how was your experience in the last minute? 
how would you define that last minute? Was that your experiencing self or was that your remembering self? I don't think Kahneman himself is going to be able to tell the difference. So your experiencing self and your remembering self will sometimes have different answers to the question, are you happy with your life? For example, your remembering self may, may think, my life sucks, but your experiencing self may not be entrenched in so much pain. So, so then how do you answer that question? Are you happy? And the other thing he mentioned was that system two is kind of equivalent to the remembering self because it's actively recalling the experience. It requires the brain capacity to call up all those experiences. Whereas system one, is the experiencing self because the experiencing self has no voice and it's automatic, which is what system one is. But I don't really think there's a true analogy between the two systems and the two selves that Kahneman defined. So although I disagree with Kahneman about the remembering self versus experiencing self, I do agree with him that in order to avoid the fallacy in our memories as well as in our judgment, sometimes you really need to consciously remind yourself, now you're falling into system one and you need to switch back into an active form of thinking in system two so that you can make an informed decision in a complex situation about what is the most rational decision what's the rational thought, what you should be thinking in your mind. And I'm going to end with the best quote, I think, in this book that I really like. And the quote is, Nothing in life is as important as you think it is when you are thinking about it. 